Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Big East Rewind. I am Chuck Everson from Villanova University, your host, and my co-host lights up a room just by walking into it. My good friend, my buddy, my point guard, Sonny Sparrow. How are you, Sonny? Doing great, Chuck. Doing great. Got another oh. great guest, a guy that we've been sort yeah. of after through well, some it, fi it finally channel. happened, Sonny. Let's just right? call it the way it is. It finally happened. There's yeah. been one team that's kind of been vacant from the Big East Rewind, and you know who I mean. It's that team up that plays up near the Boston Garden. Boston College, the Boston College Eagles are here finally. You know, this is our first Eagle player. Yeah, it's our first, first Eagle player. player. And All right. it only right. took 70 shows to get them on. So, <laughs> you know, so, listen, better late than never. I'm glad they're coming. Hopefully that'll open the door for some of his teammates. And let me introduce you to our uh, our guest today. Our, you know, this guy uh, was was the guy uh, back when we were playing Sonny for the Boston College. He sure was, he, man. He, he uh, is a Boston College Hall of Famer. He's got, uh, you know, 1,795 points and over 700 rebounds to his credit from Connecticut. He was also the second round draft pick of the Golden State Warriors and was traded uh, immediately to the Clippers where he had a healthy career. The lefty with the killer jump shot, Jay Murphy. How are you, Jay? Good to have you with us. I'm doing well, and I'm excited to be on the show, guys. I appreciate it, and it's, uh, you know, like you said, hopefully there's many more Eagles to follow, but um, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, this is something I didn't really know about your podcast. So I'm, I'm going to be a, uh, a follower for sure. And we'll send this out to as many people as I can. That's Thank awesome. You. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. It, you know, it's, it's been a labor of love really between uh, Sonny and I and, and the guys that played with us and against us uh, uh, with the big East. I mean, it, it, it kind of happened by accident and we're so glad that we got to do it because we forged so many relationships that we never would have thought that we would have had, you know, Sonny is Sonny's breaking bread with Hoyas, you know, the orange men of the Hoyas are breaking bread. We had, uh, wasn't Andre, easy at first, Jay. Wasn't no, easy at first. We had, oh, we had, I bet. Yeah, I bet. We had uh, big Andre Hawkins on with Mike Graham and we brokered peace between those two guys. And if we could do that, we're doing a good thing, I think, you know? We're sending us to the Middle East next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Get over, right. get over and help uh, Russia and the Ukraine, right? <laughs> That's it. That's it. So, Jay, let, let's just jump right into the Big East stuff. Wit, you know, talk to us about how you got to Boston College. Where, where, were, you, uh, where were your choices? I know you grew up in Connecticut. Um, where were the, what were your choices and, uh, and why Boston College? You know what? Uh, that's a great place to start. So, you know, I, I was a good player in Connecticut, but I was a 6'9", 190 pound center playing in Connecticut at Maloney High School in Meriden. So my choices weren't a lot of big choices. I was what I'd call a mid-level recruit. So my final five or six schools was BC, Providence, yeah. Canisius, um, uh, Fairfield, Yukon, and then I had the, I was going to be the big fish in the small pond uh, assumption. I had a good friend who was a hell of a player there, Mike um, Papali, and he got me to go visit there. And Joe O'Brien was a coach. They had a great Division II program, but took my visits. And the reason I got to BC was there was a local kid who was a, the best athlete out of, ever out of Meriden. His name was Robert Beasting, rest his soul. And he was recruited by everybody in football from, uh, Penn State to USC, ended up at BC, and he went in and talked to Kevin Mackey and told him about Jay Murphy. So Kevin came to see me play, and he went to see Tom Davis. Kevin tells his story, and I'm still friendly with Kevin, and he says, Tom's like, he's, he's, he's a 6'9", 190-pound white guy, and, and Kevin would say, when he plays against Hartford Public and Bridgeport, he, he's not afraid of anybody, Tom. He can play at our level. And, and uh, took my visit, and the rest is history. But we had a great visit. with uh, I stayed with the football player, Robert Bistick, chose BC, and uh, it, it was a great choice. Great choice. Yeah. So, so mean, Tom ahead, Davis Tom. Was, was your guy, right? He was the guy that was recruiting. You played one year for him, right? Who's that? Coach Davis. No, two years for Tom. Okay. So two years, two okay. years for Tom and two years for Gary. Now you want to talk about different people. 
but ran the same exact stuff. Okay. Right. Exactly the same stuff because Flex. Gary was an assistant for Tom. I want to say it was at Lafayette, but I, I might be wrong on that, but he was an assistant. But Tom was a, he was a mastermind with the X's and O's and, and he was a mastermind with the mind too. He could, he could really, you know, you could say, get the most out of players or, or mess with them. But Gary Williams was a guy that you'd run through the wall for that guy. He was, you just love playing for Gary, you know? So I got the best of both worlds, but Tom, I played for a lot of coaches, the best X's and O's and tactician guy that I've ever been around. No question. Yeah. They, they ran that flex to death, man. Oh my goodness. And the flex was man to man, but the four game, he wrote a book on the four game. That was against the zone. Uh -huh. And that was a tough, that was a tough offense. So uh, those guys, you know, very good coaches, obviously Tom had success and Gary, I was so happy when he got his national championship at, at Maryland and uh, still talk to him, not, not regularly, but, but on occasion. And uh, you know, just uh, you couldn't ask for two better coaches. Yeah. So, you know, the flex, you know, let's talk about that for a second. The, the offense was a little methodical. Did you find that to be difficult to operate in? You were a pretty good offensive player, Jay. I mean, I remember, I remember banging around with you a little bit uh, back in, in the old days. Um, you know, you were kind of like a little bit ahead of your time. You were like a hybrid big guy because of your size. You were outside, inside. It was a difficult guard, kind of like, uh, like a Bobby Jones type, for those of you that, you know, remember Bobby Jones. Like, that's what you remind me of. You ran the floor well. So did that kind of stagger you and kind of uh, stagnate your game a little bit, running that particular kind of offense? No, I think it actually helped me when, when you're talking about the flex. So the flex was against the man to man. And so you got to play every position. You could be at any one of the five positions. And he had some little nuances or Tom did and Gary carried him out there where you would duck in and you get the ball. But no, I, I think it gave me the freedom to shoot the ball outside. Unfortunately, there wasn't the three ball when I, when I was in college, because I think mm -hmm. I would average a few more points. Okay. Yeah, but uh, that. That's another story. And, um, but I, I think I, I call, well, Kevin Mack used to say, Jay, you had as good an IQ in basketball as a player that I've had. And so it, it, it was easy for me to understand that stuff. And I, I just think it didn't, it didn't hold me back. It probably helped me, you know? And uh, I'll tell you, there's not a lot of teams. If you remember St. John's, what did they play? They played man to man, right? Yeah. They never played zone. And they had so much, we had so much success against St. John's because if you run that flex correctly, it's almost impossible to stop. And, you know, you can run the flex. I'm going to get, don't want to go too much into the terminology here, but you can run, the, run that flex real wide or you can get that tight. Do you remember Al Skinner at BC running that tight flex? Sure. Yeah. And, and Eddie Cooley does that now. Now we didn't do that. Spreading it out was more effective for the players we had, but, uh, I actually think the flex was an advantage for me. Uh, and, and, you know, I thrived. It's funny because I know that when we, when we had a scout, you, you had uh, Martin Clark was the other one, right. And, and the other quote big, and there was you, and it was a, it was a tough cover for us. I mean, Andre Hawkins had to cover either one of or both of you. And he didn't, he didn't really relish that. Because when you got that ball at 15 feet at that elbow on that reverse, it, you know, it was either going up or it was a one dribble you'd go. And, you know, you, you were a tough card. Plus the left-handed component. I still think that's, that's a challenge for a lot of guys. I agree with you 100% on the lefties. You know, you play <laughs> against a lefty, even if you're lefty, it's so awkward. Um, you, you look at guys like David Russell and Chris Mullen and just so many players, uh, Dwayne McLean. You just yeah. have an advantage being a lefty. It's hard to guard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think this, I think the same about the baseball diamond because I was a pitcher and there was always lefties that had this natural motion, but that's just my own personal bias. So how did you, well, how I'm going you... to add one thing on that. I got to add something on that, Sonny. So Go ahead. the lefty advantage, that's baseball. So think about tennis. Okay. Now my, my wife is a tennis buff. So we're watching a lot of us open right now. Do you know that um, uh, Nadal's uncle made him, he's a right-handed, made him play tennis left-handed? Wow. Really? And, and that guy's had, 
you you look at him. He's. I think if he was a right-handed player, he wouldn't be as good as he is. Yeah. Good point. Right? So yeah. I'm all about the lefties, the soft <laughs> one. <laughs> So, so how long did it when you went in as a freshman and and, and, and I went in I went in thin too so I, I know what that's like was there pressure on you to, to either put weight on right away or how, how was it what was the plan for you as a freshman there was no real plan actually and back then weights weren't a big thing we had a what was it a nautilus uh machines in our in <laughs> our right. training room but I sort of got lucky we had a couple seniors uh a guy named Joe Bolio and Vinnie Carraher, who were good players. Now, they had started as juniors. But uh, that summer, they drank a lot of beer, okay? And they came back, and they were not in great shape. And Tom Davis, he's that guy, I told you, he can get into your mind. And I just worked my butt off. And so when I was a freshman, I'm 6'9", I'm 190 pounds, and, and I'm starting at the 5, not at the 4, at the 5, in the Big East. So let, let me give you a couple of names. Ed Spriggs, yep. Wayne McCoy. Um, uh, who, who was, I'm trying to think who was up at Syracuse. Chuck, Chuck and Corny, Chuck and Corny. Yeah, yeah, oh, Chuck and Corny at UConn. And Syracuse John Pannone, Danny Chase. Okay, yeah. and Danny Chase. Those are the guys I'm playing against at 6'9", 190 pounds. But I used what I had. Now, we played a lot of zone, but offensively, I was quicker than those guys. And I think the left hand had a little lefty jump hook. It, it was an advantage for me. But th there were some big boys in that league. Yes, there was. Yeah. Now you know, let's talk about let's talk about your Robert Center. What a oh tough place to play. <laughs> that was the worst. I hated that place. Uh, that rubber floor too. I mean, uh, oh man. Second only to Walsh Gymnasium. But talk about talk about what it was like to have that home court. That home court. I, I don't know what the number is, but I got to say it was probably five or six points a game. Just, you know, if you looked at the scores and it was the students were up above, there was a few rows of bleacher and then the students were up above and it was, uh, it was a big time home court advantage. I don't have the exact number. I, I did pull up a couple stats, which we'll get into later. Okay. But uh, on that one, I think in four years, I lost three games on my home court. I believe my it. team, the teams okay. I was on, not me, but the teams I was on, it was an incredible home court advantage. And so that meant a lot of good times after the games too. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's one way of looking at it. Are we, we going to yeah. get into that too, Jay? Are we going to get into well, that? Well, we, we can, because I, I do remember a couple of trips up to Syracuse, my, <laughs> my freshman year when we lost in the big East and I, and I ended up uh, having a beverage with Bill Raftery because they lost the first night too. <laughs> <laughs> were you at the and, library by any chance the library uh, I, I don't remember the name and then i was i was pretty friendly with eric sanifer so we, we we had a couple of good times out and i i met uh, a family that he was involved with so it was yep. always yep. a good trip up to syracuse you know getting back to the robert center for a second jay that yep. that yep. place not only was the court tough to play on you know it beat you up physically but the fans are right on, were right on top of you, like they were in a lot of the biggie schools. You know, we had the Cat House right. on Villanova's campus. Yeah, the no. Palestra. Yeah, that place. yeah the, the Palestra, too, was right on top of you. But I remember they gave it to Harold Presley, like, unmercifully, you know, with the Harold, Harold. They kept – and they tortured him. And that, it threw his game. You guys beat us up there um, and because he couldn't play at, at all. I mean, I felt – it was to the point, it was so bad that the guys on our team actually started feeling bad for him at that point. Yeah, they would usually pick out somebody, you know, and what, <laughs> whatever the reason was. But, uh, yeah, no, they were they were great fans, and uh, it was a band box. That's what I call it. It was just yeah. – it was so tight and so small, and, you know, it just filled up so quick. And it was they, – they, people were right on your shoulders, and it, it, was, it was a great home court advantage. So I know that – we beat uh, Georgetown when they were number one in the country in that gym, for sure. Yeah. So those are, you know, things that, like, I don't remember a lot of games. You remember all your teammates, but there were a couple games in there that uh, we, we took care of some business when nobody thought we would. And, uh, you know, so great memories of, of Robert Center. And today, their court, I got to say, it's it's like a hockey arena. But they, they are. It is are a hockey arena. Building, yeah. Yeah, they're building a new practice facility, and and hopefully they they continue to make improvements. You know. 
Now, did you ever, by your senior year, did you play any in the Boston Garden? Do you have any games there? Yeah, we played. So after, uh, I think we beat Georgetown when they were number one. And then, you know, uh, our good friend, rest his soul, John Thompson, was complaining that, you know, they played in the in the Landover in, in the Landover Center. They, they weren't in McDonough too much anymore. So we should be playing in the garden. And we, we actually, we played them in the garden. I'm trying to think if we played St. John's. I'm not sure, but we played Georgetown in the garden too. So they, they moved some of the bigger games to the garden, which it was difficult because the Celtics played there. The Bruins played there. It was, you know, like, like any big arena, but uh, yeah, there was, there was always that banter going on, you know, with those coaches in that league. And you think about the coaches in that league, just legends, all of them, right? I mean, it was incredible. Sure was. Yeah. Yeah. You had your advantages there too, Jay. I mean, it, it wasn't like any arena. I, I, I remember getting dressed early and being the first one out so I could take in all the banners and everything. And you go to dribble the ball and the ball stayed on dead, the floor. Dead spots you know, all over. The ball the never came spot. up. It just, I've never seen that before in my life. You could have put a stack of quarters in some of the gaps on the floor. It was unbelievable, that place. Yeah, no, it was, it was a special place and it was just an honor to play there. And, you know, you think about the places you got to play in the Big East. Uh, I mean, the Dome was just incredible, okay? So one story about the Dome is, like, uh, we're, we're on the line. Martin Clark's on the line. I think we're down one or we're up. We're, we're up one, and he shoots a free throw, and he, and he makes it. Or he, The second one, he misses, though. And who gets and, – and Syracuse gets the rebound. If I, I, This video is everywhere. And so before that yeah, free yeah. throw, I go, I go over to the referee, and I'm like, if – he makes it. We want to time up. Well, he misses it. You guys get the re Syracuse gets the rebound. One pass to Pearl and from three quarter court. Right. And I'm standing direct or half court. I'm standing directly behind, him, like directly behind. Him. And yep. he lets that thing go. And it's just tracking towards the rim. And all of a sudden, all you see is it goes through the net. Now you got 30,000 people erupted. And besides that, Pearl's following the shot, and I'm sort of watching him. He crosses half court. He runs right down, and he runs out of the arena. I mean, it was the loudest noise I ever heard in basketball. Honestly, it's just a it's it's a it's a great memory. You know, we lost the game, but just uh, that was that was Big East basketball at its best. And, yeah. and then you had almost thirty thousand take the court in about thirty seconds, right? I mean, it was it was bedlam after that. It was nuts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it was, uh, and you know, rest Pearl's soul. I, 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 I got to know him a little bit, but I traveled on a trip to him with Spain in Spain when he was, he had a few years in the NBA and then he was looking for a job. And so was I, but we were roommates and, and what a great guy. What, what a good human being. Uh, and uh, it's a sad, sad loss. He, he had to pass so early, you know? Yep. I agree. Yeah, that, that's one of the guys that gets mentioned uh, the most, probably Sonny, right? On, on our show is uh, every, everybody's got fond memories of the Pearl, you know, yeah. off, and off, both off and on the court, you know, just I mean, hit, hit as a person, just incredible, but his talent was just, I thought he was going to be a 10 time NBA all-star. That's how good I thought he was. And uh, you know, things happen, guys, you, you get lucky, you get this, you get that, you know, I, I, you think about it. I played with Michael Adams and John Bagley. What a backcourt that was. 25 yeah. years in the NBA between them, both 5'10", 5'11", or smaller. And, like, that's unheard of back then. There were, yep. only, there were only 240 guys in the NBA back then. So, yeah. Bagley was talk, tough. About, talk about Bagley for a minute, Jay. I mean, that guy was very – he got the most out of his God-given talent. I mean – you know, he's one of those guys. You look at him, you go, oh, this guy can't play. And then he gets 30, you know. Yeah, he, he's 20 pounds overweight. He's, yeah. he's got that little chubby body. But his his natural God-given ability. So there's a guy, Frank Catapano, who represented us all. We talk about a lot of players. And, I mean, John Bagley was the most naturally talented. I'm not saying he was the hardest worker, but he had a hell of a career. He played 13 years. He had triple doubles with the Celtics yeah. at the end of his career. Yep. And he was he was Big East Player of the Year as a sophomore or junior and went hardship and, you know, drafted like 11th or 13th with Cleveland. But that guy, I mean, you watch him play. My, I had a couple of buddies from my hometown who used to come to all the games. They used to just be mesmerized by the things he could do on the basketball court. I mean, he was – and I, I played with some 
some pretty good guards. I played with Norm Nixon. I played with some talented guys in the NBA. I'm going to tell you, John Bagley, talent-wise, pretty close to any any one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. He was a tough – well, we we did play some man-to-man, I'm going to say that, but he was a tough cover. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you asked me to cover Michael Adams too? I mean, please. That's tough. No, I those to cover a water bug. The guy was yeah, so good. No, he was everywhere. I mean – Two different players, but just incredible players still. So think about how I, I was lucky. I was blessed to have those guys throwing me the ball, right? I got so many layups underneath by just having my hands in the right place. It was, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was just, we had a lot of talent. We had Bagley Adams. We had John Garris, if you guys remember him. So yeah, we had, big, strong we had guy. Some, yeah, he was, he was a second round draft choice. And uh, so you know, we, we had some good talent, not, not, not as much as Syracuse, probably I'd say equal to Villanova's, but you know, I don't, I don't know if our, our payroll was as big as Syracuse's either. I don't know about yeah, you. Sure. Chuck. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think you guys, I don't think you guys got much above minimum wage. I know. <laughs> well, I, no, I no, no NIL. We, we were, we were CBA contracts. You guys, your guys were on NBA contracts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always said, do you think Pearl, and, and Carmelo and, and uh, Derek went up there for the snow. I don't think so. Okay. But no, it's all, all good. It's uh, I'm, I'm teasing with that. You know that. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> wow. Okay. So <laughs> now, you know, you know, so now let's get into, let's get into some of the, uh, some of the, the teams that gave you guys a tough time, Jay. What, what yep. were some of the teams that gave you fits? Well, Syracuse, I think, gave us a tough time. I think we were like 500 against Syracuse because that zone, and it still is to this day, it, it was a bear, you know? It, it was so long and so spread out that you couldn't prepare. Like, you, there was nothing else like that that you played against, so you didn't really prepare for that until that week that you played uh, Syracuse. So that, that was always a tough one. I think St. John's we had a lot of success with. I think Villanova gave us trouble too. What I remember about Villanova was every time down the court, basically, you guys change defenses. So That's right. yeah, sometimes on so, the same possession, Jay. No, exactly. And if you if you didn't have an IQ or you didn't have something that you could run against uh, multiple defenses, it made it very difficult, you know. But uh, and and you know, for for me, Providence. They were a good team, but I, I always struggled when I was inside because Otis Thorpe was just a he, – he was just beast. a beast, you know. It was yeah. it was so hard to play against him. So, everybody – you know, you know each other so well. So, it's it, it was – there was a lot of challenges, but uh, great competition. And, uh, you know, Syracuse, those stood out. And then when you go up and try to shoot jumpers in that dome and you're not used to it, that was that was different for sure. Well, it's a lot different than your than where you play for sure. That's that's a big difference going no from question. that to the other gym. What were some of, what were some of the other um, matchups? Because you said you you mentioned it already your freshman year, being a six nine, right. one eighty, and and yep. as you yep. as you progressed, I mean, in comes Patrick Ewing, Bill Wennington, you know, or to Storp. I mean, just the bigs were really prevalent you know, in, in the, in the conference, what was that like? Right. So, so my first two years, I played only the five at BC. I was, I was the center back to the basket, trying to get that little baseline pass. But my junior and senior year, we, we had a kid named uh, Roger McCready, who was a six, five kid out of New York city, a tough, strong kid. So he played in the post. So I played the, the, the face up forward, which was a four man. I'd get on the block and then I'd pop out. So that was really an advantage for me because mm-hmm. when teams would play man to man, you know, Patrick Union would have to guard me. Now I, I wasn't going inside that much against him, but, but our theory was if you go at him four times, he's going to follow you one or two. And you're going to get to the line. If you do that enough, he's going to get in foul trouble, but, but I would take him out to the top of the key and I could shoot over the top. And the same thing with guys like Bill Wennington and, and the bigger guys, when I was playing the four, and they were playing man to man, or if they played zone, I still got to pop out on the wing and shoot a lot of jump shots. So my, my junior and senior year, it was, it was a much easier time for me to score. And I got to shoot a lot more jump shots 
than I did when I was a freshman or sophomore. So mm-hmm. those were, uh, those were some, you know, I, I sort of got lucky because I, I did the grind the first two years and you, you do the dirty work when you're a young guy, you do what's the best for the team. And, you know, I was lucky to start four years, but my junior and senior year, I, I was pretty much the go-to guy along with Michael Adams and John, uh, uh, John Garrett. So okay. it was, uh, it, w- it was a pretty, pretty lucky and smooth transition for me. I tell you what, you mentioned his name. I'm going to, I'm going to ask about him. You know, Raj, yeah. Raj McCready, he had it tough, man. At six, four, he's playing with his back to the basket. That's not exactly his uh, spot that he played in high school. You know, talk about him and his sacrifice that he made for that crew. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think just, uh, he was a tough kid from the city and you know what? He, he was, he was actually good in that position. I think he was a better back to the basket guy than he was a face up guy. Like he wasn't a, great shooter but but he was tough and and the way they taught that offense that that four game that we ran uh against the zone he he always knew the places to be but he was yeah he would he totally sacrificed himself for the team which as you guys know mostly when you're a freshman and sophomore unless you're a you know you're going to be a a guaranteed nba guy that that's the way college basketball is every kid gets recruited you know, back then and today where they tell you you're going to be the best thing since sliced bread. And then when you get there, you're going to do what's good for the team, not what's good for you. So uh, Roger was, was the, uh, you know, prime example of that as many other guys were. So, and, and I want, I want to mention, uh, I know Mark couldn't join us tonight, coach Schmidt, who's done a phenomenal job up at St. Uh, St. Bonaventure, but you think about now he was a hell of a player. I, I didn't know him then in high school, but, you know, he's, he was a baseball player. He, he was a quarterback, and he was a hell of a basketball player. And then you got John Bagley and Michael Adams in the backcourt. It's hard to break into that lineup sometimes. You know, it's just sort of being in the not being in the right place at the right time, or just having somebody in front of you. You know, you we've all seen it in sports. So, um, but yeah, the the other two guys that you haven't mentioned it. Stu Primus was a pretty good player, and so was uh, Troy Bowers. <laughs> You know, both, both of those guys, guys, yeah. Well, we had a we had a lot of good players. Now, Stu was Stu was a really good player, just a phenomenal athlete, just six three stud, and just got better and better. And Troy was, you know, he was a young guy when I was there, so he he didn't get a lot of playing time. But you know, who was a, was a really good player? Rest his soul was Dominic Presley. I don't Dom know Presley, if, yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, he, that was one of Gary Williams' first recruits, and I mean, you want to talk? He probably could have been an all-american in track i mean when we used to go do our training on the track that kid could get up and down the court he was and, lightning fast yeah just uh you know a great guy and uh unfortunately uh you know is not with us anymore but um, yeah. All, yeah. all good teammates you always remember your teammates you know the the guys that played the guys that didn't play and and uh you know the, the scores you don't remember so much but uh all, all, yeah those are those are great memories your story about McCready reminds me, John Calipari talked about when he brought Anthony Davis and he was recruiting him and, and Anthony Davis wanted to play the point guard. And he was like, yeah, you, you could play the point guard, but you know, our, our point guard, our guards, they post up a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that's a, that, that's funny. See, that's, that's a good cow line right there. So. Uh, so what are, what are some, what are some of your funny stories and memories of things? All right, so we'll we'll start with which is a, my Syracuse story, Coach Beheim. So all right, drop um, the Coach B story. Yeah, we'll drop the Coach B story. So uh, this is this is after I I was done playing. So my son Eric was a was a pretty highly top forty player in, in high school. So he was sort of off the radar. And then we go down a Rumble in the Bronx, which I'm sure you guys have heard of. Have you heard yep. of that tournament down at Fordham? Yep, we played and, in that. Yes. Yeah, and, and he and he drops like 44 and 35 back to back. So now now the phone's blowing up. Calhoun, everybody's calling, right? So so I'll never forget this. I know where I was on 95. So the phone rings and I don't recognize the number, but I answer. And he's like, he's like, Jay. I said, Yeah, he says, This is Coach Bay. I said, How you doing, coach? He goes, Good. He goes, listen, he goes, you know, I'd like to talk to you about your son. So we're on the phone about two minutes and we get cut off. Okay. And, you know, just the drop call, whatever. And so, so then he calls me back. He's like, 
you know what? I know what that was. He goes, that was the BC burner phone that just cut me off because they knew I was talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was always good for a joke, but I, I didn't know much when I was a player, but, uh, you know, hell of a coach, obviously, and a recruiter, but I always got a kick out of that story. He made light of that, the BC burner phone. I said, I don't think BC's got any burner phones, but uh, anyway. He's got, a, he's got a dry sense of humor. It's very Oh, fun. he does. Yeah. He, he's, he's great. But, uh, no, we, we had some, you know, the BC things. So there was that pecking order, like you guys know, right? And, and I'm sure you guys have some stories. But with John Bagley, John Bagley was the most humble guy you'll ever meet, okay? But John wasn't always on time, okay? Once in a while, John was late, especially when it was a, like a 7 a.m. bus or, or a 6 a.m. bus to go to the airport or whatever. But you know what? That bus wasn't waiting for tom davis that bus was gone unless it was john bagley that bus wasn't leaving till john bagley got on the bus so that tells you how important he was to that team and we always joked about that <laughs> yeah we, we we had a team curfew and then it changed for john <laughs> there you go exactly i'm yep. sure you guys had some curfew changes for pearl and people like that over uh, we there. had a couple for you know red and, and eric and those guys sure yeah there you go there you go. Well, those are, yeah, those are the guys I remember. So I played against my years. The, the, the main three were Leo red and, and uh, Eric. Yep. And I got to yep. know Eric a little bit and uh, hung out with those guys and, and great guys. And I mean, just a, a beautiful area up there, but uh, you know, we, we had our curfews too and uh, they weren't always uh, held up. We, we had a couple trainers. So I, I got a, I got a good story for you. So you know who Bruce Pearl is, right? Sure do. Sure. So Bruce is still a good friend. Now, Bruce was the manager of the Boston College basketball team. Oh, wow. Okay. And then I'm going to digress. But so Bruce is the manager. And, uh, you know, th there was always there was always the bathtub was full of the right stuff after the game with some ice in it. OK, Bruce was the man. But um, so we go down to, to uh, Tuscaloosa. We're in the, in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And. Uh, we, we got our mascot down there, Eddie the Eagle. Now, Eddie the Eagle gets the flu, okay? Now, Bruce is, like, he's the man. He's Tom Davis, he's, loves him, he's the manager. Tom Davis looks at him, he says, Bruce, you're the Eagle tonight. <laughs> so Bruce had to put on the Eagle uniform, the <laughs> outfit, and go be the Eagle at the game. So that's, uh, but, but Bruce has had a hell of a career. Yes, and he, he follows Tom Davis. So he went with Tom Davis uh, to Stanford, then to Iowa. Then he was at Southern Indiana and won a Division II national championship. This is a, I'll make this quick. Gets the job at, um, uh, what's it? It's not Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but it's, uh, I can't think of the, it's, it's a good smaller school in that area, right? And, and went, beats BC to go to the Sweet 16 and parlays that into the Tennessee job. How's wow. that for a little ride? That, yeah, that's, that's a good run. That, that's a pretty, hard good, uh, pretty good path. So, but he and I are still good friends. So those are some of the, I still keep in touch with a lot of those guys. You know, I don't know if you guys do, you know, uh, more, more so my college teammates than my NBA teammates for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now that you touched on the NBA briefly, let's talk about that. You know, you got drafted um, second round uh, by Golden State. And did you know when they picked you that you you weren't going to play a second there? They were gonna they were gonna trade you. Or was that a surprise to you? No, that was uh, that was a, a a real surprise. So I'm up in Boston with uh, my agent Frank Catapano. I don't know if you know that name. He represented all the BC guys. Catapano. Hey. Catapano. Yeah. Catapano. <laughs> and and still doing well. 82 years old. He represented my boys for a number of years. So we're watching the draft, and this is way back in the day. So it's on ESPN, but they go to commercial, and then they come back and they show the picks that were missed. So that was me. Okay, so I go to Golden State. So, okay, I'm going to Golden State. So I drive home to Connecticut to see my family. So hang on, Jay. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but and you're telling me that you're, you know, you know you, you got a shot at getting drafted. And you don't even get to hear them call your name. It's a commercial. Is that what yep. you're saying? This is, come on, this is 1984. 
<laughs> but but didn't they have something down at like wherever it was at the garden or the you know radio uh, no, city I, or whatever? Mean, I, I, you know, uh, I wasn't going. There was no talk about going to the garden. Uh, it was like I was going to go up to his house in in Boston and, and watch the draft. So so it wow. was the commercial came back and th there's my name picked and uh, you know I'm I'm as happy as can be. You got your name called. That's a dream come true. Drive back to Connecticut. He calls me up. He says uh, you're with the Clippers. <laughs> so there was a wow. it was a pre-draft deal with uh, me for Jerome White, who was uh, if you remember him from Marquette. Yeah, Marquette. And, uh, yeah. So I spent a couple of years with uh, the Clippers. Then I went with the Bullets for a couple of years. But you talk so about who is who was on that Clippers uh, team with you, Jay? Oh, I'm going to tell you the talented guys that I played with. So um, uh, Bill Walton. Wow. Norm, Norm Nixon. And now there was there was a trade too. So Marcus Johnson and Junior Bridgman, and oh, wow. I mean, you want to talk about wow. some, some talented guys? Unbelievable, unbelievable like. guys. Um, and then I we had a, some unheralded guys. So uh, Michael Cage, who had a nice NBA career. Remember San Derek Diego Smith? State? He was a good yeah. player. Yeah, Derek Smith from Louisville, who uh, passed away, but he was a hell of a player, a great guy. And so, I, I mean, I was a rookie. It was just like, you know, you're just, you're sort of just going along with the flow. I mean, Walt was just a character. You want to talk about a, a character. And, you know, if you'd, you'd be uh, getting taped and he'd walk in and say, hey, rookie, get off the table. You got to get off the table. He said, go get you some water. You go get him some water. That's the, that's the way the NBA worked back there. So back then, did you, get, so, did you get a lot of that stuff as as the rookie? And who was there? Another rookie with you? Yeah, well, there were three of us. It was Lancaster Gordon from Louisville and Michael okay. Cage and myself. So uh, we got mostly from Bill. The other guys were pretty mellow. So, um, but Bill was a character, and he made us do all kinds of things. Nothing bad, you know. But uh, you know, carry his briefcase, carry this, whatever. And then, uh, so then I went to the Bullets, and you want to talk about uh, some talent, too. So the, 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 we had the front court. Now, this is after he was injured, but the front court we started was Moses Malone, Dan Roundfield, and Bernard King. Wow. Yeah, Bernard King was there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's, I mean, I don't know if there was a, in their prime, I'm not sure who was better. Roundfield led the league in rebounding. Moses was Moses, and. You know, Bernard could score 40 on anybody, but... Uh, now, is that we before had... the Rulin and Mahorn days, or...? No, this is after, yeah. This yeah. was after. Yeah. Rulin and Mahorn were there with uh, uh, McMillan and those guys, and I was after that. Right. And then, right. Uh, um, so, but we also had the, uh, just an interesting uh, group, because we had Manute on that team, who was my roommate, who I've got great Manute stories, rest his soul. Um and we had Muggsy Bogues on the same team. So you got 5-3 wow. and you got 7-7. Seven, seven. That had to be hilarious, <laughs> you know, for everybody. I mean, that's, so, just a, that's a gift that keeps on giving, Jay, in the locker room, I'm sure. We, you, you know? You, and, and it was, we would travel, and there were no private jets back then. So you're walking through the airport. And people, like, you got Muggsy walking next to Manu. And, you know, Muggsy's got the, the fur coat on. Manu's got this suit on. And you just, it was, it was comical and in a good way, you know? And, give us a couple uh, so, of minute. Give us a couple of minute stories, Jay. Okay, so Manute, um, Manute was uh, he was represented by Frank Catapano too. So he was okay. with the Bullets, and uh, so I ended up living with Manute, and uh, it was funny. So M Manute was new to the country. Um, he he gets a he gets a Bronco. Remember the big Broncos? Sure. And yeah. So he's he's he knows how to drive, but he doesn't like to drive. So he would always ask me to drive because we'd go to practice together. I had my own car, but he would say, let's go in my Bronco. So what they had to do for Manu was the seat that he sat in the driver's seat, they moved it back like the brackets. So the space between the front window and the back window was about 10 inches. So when I drove that, car, that Bronco, if you look from the side, it looked like nobody was driving the car. <laughs> so, 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 so people would look over. And then, then they knew it was him or whatever because of I he had a license plate, and uh, it, it was hysterical. And uh, we spent the summer in New Orleans together training. They were trying to put some weight on him, and he, and he got he was and this is you know this was Manute. He was new to the country. 
he was afraid to keep the air conditioner going. He would turn it off at night because he thought something would happen. I mean, just a humble, good guy. Um, I was, I was the first one to visit him when he had his first child, my wife and I, she wasn't my wife then, but, uh, you know, there's, there's, he just, he made you laugh and, uh, always a character, always a character. And then I got to say, we had one guy in that locker room and he wasn't a player on our team, but he hung around that team with Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh, really? And everybody got to know him and he lived in the DC area. So, uh, just, uh, just an interesting, you know, knowing guys from different sports and, and whatever. So, uh, so I gotta, I gotta ask you, Jay, being a person of size myself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and, and, you know, listen, you're, I'm not Manu bowl height, but I mean, you know, I know what it is to go into a, a regular size house and have to duck as do you at six, nine. Okay. Ducking um, under things, you know, yeah, yeah. right. So what was it like for that guy? You know, it just was, the day-to-day was, day stuff, getting in and out of things, you know. No, going... it, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was different for him, obviously. Like, he had the car change, but, um, you know. Flying commercial had to be horrible. They would get him two seats is what they would do, actually. Yeah, okay. so he could sort of spread out. But, no, it, it was, a, his clothes, everything was custom made for him. But, yeah, it was, it was a, a challenge for him, obviously, being that size. But I can tell you what, when you practice and played against him, I mean, what? so I used to play one-on-one against him every day after practice when we were at the Bullets. Yeah. So you'd give him the head fake, you'd go by him, but you, you had to be so careful how you laid it up because he could get you from behind. He, he could dunk the ball on his tiptoes, okay? Yeah. Now, he didn't, like that, that. he didn't like to do that because – I don't know if he was embarrassed by it, but, but he would only do it in front of certain people, you know, and, but he could dunk the ball on his tiptoes. That's how long that guy was. Wow. Yeah. I gotta ask, I gotta ask you in LA Clippers, cause we had Charlie, Charles Smith on and he talked about that situation and how it was run like a secondhand team and, and Donald Sterling and stuff. Did you have any of those interactions? Um, yeah, well, it was a little bit funky because the first year I was there was the first year they moved from San Diego to LA. So we practiced in a YMCA. Yeah, that's yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. So we uh-huh. practiced it, we practiced in a YMCA and then we played our games at the, at USC's home court. <laughs> so we didn't wow. even have a place, we, we, you know, the joke back then was there was, we were the slippers, not the clippers. It was, you know, and you're in the, you're, you're in the town. <laughs> With, with in Tinseltown with the Lakers, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, it was like you were, you, you were a second class, not a second class citizen, but it, you, you knew what was going on. There's, so that, that was totally true. What Charles said, there's no question about it. No That's question. Something. Now Sterling was running a team when you were there. Yeah. He wasn't in, I mean, he wasn't around a lot, but he was definitely the owner. There's no question. Yep. And uh, you know, it's, as they say with, with most businesses or all businesses, you know, it starts at the top. And so things, uh, there was always a change in management, change in coaches. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was my first experience in the NBA. So I didn't really know anything different, but when I went to uh, Washington and a Poland was the owner and, and, uh, Wes Unsell was the GM the first year. And then he became the coach. You yeah, saw the, the difference. Yeah. Big difference. So. Big Wes, yep. Yeah, big Wes, yep. Yeah, he, yeah, he was, he was a tough. You know, he got a lot out of his stuff too. I, I, I was uh, tight with Cupcheck, and he would bring Wes to camp. You know, and the big thing was that you know the game's not over till the fat lady sings. Remember that whole thing when sure. they beat uh, the Sonics. So Mitch would ride the bus with us to camp, and uh, there was a guy in the bus with us, a, a high school kid, but he was a big jacked up kid big, strong, tough kid named Bramel. And Bramel said, I always thought Wes Unsell was the fat lady. That was the joke. But we get to <laughs> camp and unbeknownst to us and Bramel, Wes is there as the as the speaker for the camp, okay? So Mitch is sitting in the stands and he's got this look on his face. I said, something's going on. So Wes throws the ball off the backboard, catches it, turns in the air and hits the other backboard on the fly, full court. It was amazing to see, you know? He goes, I need a, I need a, uh, a volunteer. How about you, young man? Come on out here. 
and he picks by by luck Vermel, you know. Yeah. So I'm sure Mitch was in his ear. By so luck or by design, that's right. What I want to know. He's throwing <laughs> outlet passes to Vermel and putting him in the fifth row. He hits, <laughs> he throws the ball. He hits the kid in the chest. The kid goes into the fifth row. This was this went on for about you know ten minutes or so. Camps over, we get back in the van, and Mitch goes, "What were you saying about the fat lady, Bromel? Did you still think he's the fat lady?" So oh. yeah, so I, I that's our that's our Wes Unsold story. So yeah, no, he was you know he he wouldn't do much with us when he was he was the coach, but he he could show you a few things, and I mean he was you think about it, his size and, and what he did and, oh, and yeah. won that championship, and from winning that championship, he had carte blanche and, and with, with the bullets forever and. And, and just a humble, good guy, you know? Yep. Yep. Very true. Of Very all true. the years that you played, Jay, and, and all the places you played, where, where did you have the most fun? Oh, let's see. The most fun? Uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, college was an incredible, like college is supposed to be the best four years of your life. So that, that was incredible. But Italy, I really enjoyed. The NBA, I didn't play a lot. So I was on the bench. I had a great seat and I got paid. But Italy was a great experience. And it was like, <laughs> excuse me, it was like college again because you average 20 and 10. And the people were great. The food was great. And it was, it was a good experience. And you played against guys like uh, Dawkins was over there then. And um, Jamal Wilkes was over there. There were Sugar Ray... Um, what, oh, what, not Sugar Ray. What, what's Michael the, Ray uh, Richardson. Michael Ray Richardson, yeah, from yeah. the Nets. And there were there were a lot, a lot of good players over there. Um, so that was that was a great experience. I I, I loved Italy, and uh, France was good, but Italy was probably my favorite of Europe. So, but uh, BC, you can't ask for more. We won a couple regular season championships. We made two Sweet Sixteens and Elite Eight. Didn't get to the final four, but uh, so many good memories, you know. Who was the other American with you in Italy? Uh, I had a few, but th there was a guy. This guy was a hell of a player. Larry Spriggs. Do you know that name? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hmm. So so Larry went to Howard, and Larry was a 6'9", 250-pound, like yeah, just a monster. Yep. But really knew how to play. And, you know, people don't realize he, he was the starting forward with uh, the Lakers when they won the championship. It was Magic and Byron in the backcourt, Larry and uh, Jabbar and uh, James Worth. I mean, that's right. that's a heck of a five right there. Or he there was a heck of a four and he fit in. So it was he was he was a great teammate. Good to like spend a lot of time with him because he he wasn't married at that time and he would be with my family and me. And Larry was he was a talented guy, really talented. So uh, you mentioned your boys. Talk about what it was like you got you're raising boys your wife you know is a professional basketball player from finland you said and so now did they have pressure growing up that they had to play ball or had to you know be like mom or be like dad i mean talk about that environment that had to be a little bit of a challenge in the beginning yeah you know what i think there was a lot more pressure than we realized but not so much when they were younger but when they when the recruiting came about so my oldest boy was the first one, and, you know, he was uh, – we, we played some AAU. Uh, we met people through Jim Barron, uh, who was the coach at URI, and, and my boys were friendly with Billy and Jimmy. And um, so he ended up going to prep school and, and, and getting better, but I never pushed him. I just said, I'll give you the tools if you, if you want to work at it. And we went to an AAU tournament when he was 13 years old. He wasn't eligible because we joined the team too late. And we're down in, uh, in Virginia, our, uh, Virginia Beach, and he's watching 13-year-olds dunk the ball. And he's like, Dad, he goes, like, if, I'm, if I want to do this, I, I got I to gotta get a lot better. So I gave him all the drills, all the old school, the Mikans, all that stuff. And he worked and he, he had a passion for the game. I never made him play, but he had a passion for the game. And then he went to prep school, and, you know, he was a top 40 player player we visited florida and he fell in love with the place and he fell in love with billy donovan and had a hell of a career and and still is playing at 31 so you know yeah. the second one probably the most talented uh top 20 top three small forwards in the country with uh 
Uh, a couple other guys, I can't think of the last name, Shabazz, uh, not, not the kid from UConn, but another kid out West, and chose Duke, had some bad luck with a concussion, whatever, but, 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 but did well and was roommates with Austin Rivers, ended up at Florida after transferring. He got a degree and then went to Northeastern. He's been in Europe for nine years now or eight years. And then my youngest one went off to, uh, he probably felt the most pressure, I would say, because you're trying to, and you, you don't think about that. So I played in the NBA. One went to Florida, one went to Duke. And, you know, it was, uh, it was, he, he probably just God given ability wasn't as good as the other two but worked as hard and ended up at Northeastern had a nice career there and went to Vermont. And as I said earlier, off, off camera that uh, he's down at a D two school um, Nova Southeastern and just wants to continue to play. He's healthy again. And, and he wants to go to Europe and have a career. So it's uh, it's been a fun ride. Um, you know, a lot of trips, a lot of basketball, a lot of driving, but uh, they all got degrees and uh, they all still love the game. So, the game's been good to me and it's been good to my family. Did, did you have them when you were playing pro in Italy? Were, were, were your boys around then? I mean, were they uh, around? Yeah, they, they were very small, very small then, but they would come to the games. Um, so they the were two, around the two lake, right? Ones. Yep, yep. So the two older ones, they'd be at the games, run around the court with the ball and stuff. But uh, yeah, so they, they were over there for a few years. That's great. That's great. And uh, like you said, you gave them the tools. Did you ever have to coach them or did you ever coach them? Oh yeah, I coached them for sure. I coached them in uh, in uh, grade school, and then it was a Catholic school. Then I coached them uh, middle school, and then all their AAU. So they played for the New England players, and uh, a fellow named John Carroll, not not Northfield Mount Hermon, but John Carroll, who coached at Duquesne and with the Celtics. Uh, I coached with him, and we we had we had some good players. We had Nate Lubick from Georgetown. We had Caleb Tarzuski from Arizona. We had uh, some guys that went to uh, Kansas. So we had a lot of good players, and uh, that was a fun experience for me, you know. Those are some players right there. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's a squad. Yeah. yeah. So all good. So now, now did, you, did, you ever, did you ever flirt? Did anybody ever try to entice you into, like, calling games, like play-by-play, uh, -play -play, anything? Color no, commentary? Yeah. You know, I, I never got into that. I, actually, I was asked for BC to do the, a radio thing. Yeah. But I was living in Rhode Island. That was, it was like two hours away and my kids were young and I was like, eh, that's, that's going to be a tough thing to do. You know, if I live two miles from URI, if it was that kind of distance, yeah, it would have been a different story, but that that's, you know, traveling's one thing for half the games, but those other home games, you got to drive an hour and 45 minutes each way with young kids, three of them, it, it, it would have been tough. Um, so never got into that. I coached one year in college. I coached at the University of Hartford in uh, 1998 when my third son was born with Paul Brazo, who was a BC guy. And uh, then I said, I don't want to do this because it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm midlife. And I tried to coach in Division Three and didn't get the what I was looking for and then got into, uh, uh, I'm in the insurance industry now and, and just, I still love the game, watch a lot of college basketball and Obviously, uh, I want to get to Japan to see the older two guys, but haven't been able to with the pandemic. Yeah. All right. La last question, Jay, and then we'll let you go. Who Who is the best player in the family? Is it mom? Uh, well, that depends who you ask, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I threw a lob pass to you, my man. <laughs> that, that's a loaded Don't blow this. Right? And you know what? I, you know. But my buddy, Ted Kelly, who's one of my best friends, he's a, a BC teammate of mine. He, he doesn't ask who's the best player. He always asks who is the best shooter. Okay. So, yeah. so um, you know, it, it be, for him, it comes down to me and my son, Eric, because my son, Eric, made himself a hell of a player. And he led the SEC in three-point shooting percentages last two years in the high 40s. So and there was no three when I played. So. You know, I, I, I'm going to, I'll leave that to, to somebody else, but uh, we got a lot of good shooters in the family. I'll say that. <laughs> I bet you do. Yeah. Well, Hey, listen, man, thanks for coming out. And you know, I, we hope you had a good time with us. We sure had a good oh, time. I loved it. To you. I loved it. You I got to tell you, you rival, I tell a pretty good story, but you, uh, you, you put me to a test there. You gave me a, a run for my money with the stories, man. You, you, it was great. So thank you so much. 
for coming out and hanging with us. And please let your teammates know that it's okay to come out and yeah. be on the show. We'd love to have more Eagles on the show, believe you, me. You know who would be a great guest would be John Bagley. Now, he's as oh, humble as can be. He's, yeah, and, and so I just talked to John recently, so I'm going to – I'm going to reach out to him and, and see if, you know, he he's, like I said, when I say humble, he's really humble and he's, he's not. Uh, so we'll see if he wants to do it, but I think he'd be a great guest. You've been listening and watching the Big East Rewind with Chuck Everson and Sonny Sparrow. The Big East Rewind is produced and directed by Nick Chico Chorus and Daryl Gurney. You can check us out on all things social media by putting in Big East Rewind. And if you do uh, go on Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, uh, if you go on YouTube, you can put in Big East Rewind and all of our shows will come up. We ask you that you share it, like it, subscribe and share it with your friends. Thanks a lot for joining us. Have a great night. Thank you all.